Well, unfortunately, you know, it's absolutely true that, you know, a sixth of Americans are poor. They, they, uh, there's never been so many people depending on food stamps to buy their food and so on uh, since the program started. But it's not correct to say that it's unprecedented, uh, that degree of poverty. This country had much greater poverty, uh, you know, back in the 19th century and in the early 20th century. What uh, what we're doing is we're falling back into that sort of robber baron era. The, the thing is that back then we had a very strong labor movement. We had a lot of immigrants in the country who came from European countries uh, where they had been involved in socialist movements and labor parties that were very political. And uh, that provided a kind of a critical mass so that we had a very strong labor movement develop in the early 20th century uh, and grow through the depression. Now, um, the people are so atomized and the middle class is so large that, uh, which you didn't have back then, that we have this strange phenomenon where uh, the majority of Americans are uh, still have their jobs they may be nervous about losing their jobs. They may be falling behind uh, in terms of their pay versus inflation, but they're still pretty pretty damn comfortable. They've got their two cars. They've got their, their two weeks vacation. Their kids are going to college, and it may be harder to do than it was 10 years ago, but that's what their situation is. And they really basically don't give a damn about the 20% who are uh, who are living on the edge or, mm -hmm. or even falling over the edge. And, and that's what's different from these countries where you see the people power uh, movements is that those people are desperate and uh, they're being they're being crushed, whereas the majority of Americans still aren't being crushed. And I think until they are being crushed, which could happen, um, then uh, it's hard to see these people becoming uh, the kind of activists who take to the street, who, you know, march in the millions on Washington uh, you know, who do political action. Well, uh, Mark Dankov, I'd like to get your uh, perspective on that also. And of course, uh, 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 Dave Lindorf talks about the fact that it's not unprecedented uh, uh, earlier on in U.S. history of uh, Americans being poor. But when we put that against the backdrop of the wars in Iraq, in Afghanistan, Libya, perhaps Pakistan, the amount of spending, the deficit that the United States has had, and when people realize this, this could be spent in our country, in their country, that is, you know, uh, and given this with one in six being poor, do you think that enough is enough in terms of Americans' uh, uh, point of view? Well, I think that that's exactly right. And it seems to me that if the United States becomes involved militarily in Syria uh, and against Iran, your country, which is precisely what the Israeli lobby wants, this could be the straw that breaks the camel's back in terms of creating a pre-revolutionary situation within the United States. I would also caution people, as we have talked about third parties, to beware of one other dynamic, and that is co-optation. Just as one can argue very effectively that Western intelligence agencies are attempting to co-opt uh, legitimate revolutionary movements in the Middle East, uh, the same thing is true here in the United States. Take a look at the Tea Party, for example, uh, which Allison Weir uh, made reference to earlier. Uh, the fact of the matter is that the Tea Party has grown out of the Ron Paul, Pat Buchanan wing of the Republican Party, and yet now that we're talking about presidential candidates receiving the imprimatur of the Tea Party, it's interesting how all of these people are conveniently pro-Israel, pro-Zionist, and pro-interventionist in terms of their Middle Eastern policy. This suggests that a legitimate groundswell populist movement, in this case the American right, that was coming forth to oppose some of these policies is in the process by being t uh, of being taken over by forces that are pushing the pro-Zionist uh, interventionist people like Mike Huckabee and Sarah Palin and Newt Gingrich. Uh, if we want to look, uh, Allison, we are at uh, uh, where uh, the elections are, uh, how the outcome of the elections that are going to be coming up uh, in less than a year. I mean, uh, we can start with the defeat of the Democrats in the midterm elections. That was a telling sign that Americans were not happy. So uh, if you can put that into perspective uh, in terms of uh, uh, what Americans want, i.e. the third party, I mean, in terms of the Democrats and the Republicans, people, again, based on the Gallup poll, uh, are pretty much at this point disillusioned with the political system in the U.S. Uh, at least that's what it appears 
uh, not only in terms of the poll, but all the other facts uh, surrounding uh, the state of the United States? Well, I think people are disillusioned, and that's why there does tend to be such a, a low voter turnout, which is unfortunate because, of course, um, if you're not happy with the system, what you should do, I feel strongly, is vote and uh, take greater action. But many people just sort of opt out, so that's unfortunate. In terms of what will happen with the next election, uh, I don't feel I, I can predict. I did feel strongly I knew that there, before this previous election, I knew it would be a Democrat. Um, I thought it was part of this game that now there would be a Democrat, there'd be a, a different face on the same policies, and that's exactly, of course, what has turned out to be the case. So at this point, I'm. if, if you'd asked me a few years ago, I would have made a prediction, and in that case, it would have been correct. Uh, right now, I can't make a prediction, except that I think I, I don't expect major change yet, Okay. unfortunately, even though there's so much a dissatisfaction with what's going on. One of the two party, major parties will win once again in the next election. I will make that prediction. Uh, Dave Lindorf, uh, looking at uh, the foreign policy of the United States, uh, when we put things into context in the conversation that we've had in this news analysis with our other two guests, and you inclusive, uh, you get the feeling that uh, you know, it's not going to be that uh, consequential if the United States maintains the status quo. I mean, but is that correct? I mean, if we want to look at uh, the foreign policy of the United States, let's look at the security shuffle that took place. Uh, let's look at, uh, I mean, is it uh, the non-negotiables when we talk about, for example, Israel, or when we talk about uh, the arms manufacturers and how they have to keep rolling and keep producing and manufacturing? I mean, certain things seems to be etched into uh, just policies and foreign policies of the United States, but at what cost? That you're right that the the foreign policy changes very little whichever of the two parties has the White House and has the Congress. You don't see a uh, confrontation uh, with the basic uh, imperialist stance of the United States of wanting to dominate uh, the the uh, policies and the economies around the world uh, to the U.S.'s advantage. But I think that. Um, that uh, there are things that could change this, uh, not so much who gets elected, but that the U.S. is really sort of running up against a wall now of financing, and it's not going to be possible for the U.S. to continue spending the kinds of money that it spends, uh, you know, having a defense uh, or a military budget that's as large as the rest of the world's combined uh, is not going to be able to continue. And we're starting to see that with the weakening dollar and uh, with the strains being put on the U.S. domestic budgets. So, you know, it may be that uh, we will be, uh, our, our country will be driven away from its imperialist positions by uh, simply uh, economics. And Mark Dankoff, if you can tell us uh, a little bit about uh, the question I asked, uh, your response to that. But in particular, Mark Dankoff, you know, there are uh, certain uh, people in general, even analysts and observers, that say the United States is running on a set of policies that it's ir irrelevant of what the president is thinking. There's uh, a certain group uh, maybe behind the scenes uh, that has certain policies in place that the U.S. has to uh, basically pursue. I mean, as a, a former U.S. Senate candidate, perhaps you can shed light on that, or are we going back to the Zionist uh, entity again here? Well, I think the Zionist entity is in turn tied up with the international banking interests that clearly control presidential policies and congressional policies. When I was the Constitution Party's candidate in the United States Senate race in Delaware in 2000 against Tom Carper and Bill Roth, it was most instructive for me to get into the Federal Election Commission records to see who was bankrolling both Carper and Roth. It was not simply a question of the same kinds of political and economic interests that we've been talking about here on this program being involved in bankrolling the major party candidates, but you were seeing the same names cropping up on both of the major party candidates' contribution lists. 
In other words, they had their bets covered, regardless of whether uh, Senator Roth had been reelected again uh, or Governor Carper, of course, who did in fact become Senator Carper, was elected. The fact of the matter is that the same interests had a stranglehold, regardless of how it went. In my particular case, I raised no money, literally no money, in that in that 2000 Senate race. And yet I got the combined vote total of both the uh, Constitution Party and Reform Party candidate, uh, candidates for president that year in the state of Delaware. And I think had I been running, not in 2000, but in a post 9-11 environment, uh, a lot of the issues that are resonating now with people, overextension of empire, domestic police state in this country, uh, the de demise of the manufacturing sector of the American economy uh, and all of the kinds of things that both a Ralph Nader and a Pat Buchanan or Ron Paul might be talking about, I would have had an even more effective run uh, in a post 9-11 environment than I did in the year 2000. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would say again that uh, to me the best possible scenario for a third party candidate would be to emphasize this war and to emphasize the economy. Empires run out of men and they run out of money and this is what's happening to the United States. On that we're going to leave it. Former U.S. Senate candidate, thank you. Mark Danko, Allison Weir, thank you for your statements from Los Angeles and David Lindorf, thank you for your statements and thank you for watching Newsroom at PressTV.ir for any questions that you may have. From Mika Batakwe and the entire team, it's goodbye.